The reason to go to a commercial database like this is that it's very comprehensive. So it has millions and millions of people and a lot of data about those people. It's not one commercial insurance, but broadly lots of insurances. And so if people switch carriers in the middle, we can still follow their progression throughout the disease. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden. The United States Department of Veteran Affairs has made Relivrio available for the treatment of ALS for veterans who are living with the disease and who receive care at VA clinics or ALS specialists. This makes the VA one of the first healthcare payers or insurers to provide access to the drug. The decision comes after the ALS Association urged the VA, Medicare, and other healthcare payers to provide coverage without exclusion. Now, we'll share links in the show notes so you can learn more about the fight for access to approved treatments. And as the search for more treatments and eventually a cure for ALS continues, researchers also continue to learn more about the effectiveness of already approved treatments. I recently had the chance to catch up with Dr. James Berry, the Winthrop Family Scholar in ALS Sciences, the director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Multidisciplinary ALS Clinic, and chief of the Division of ALS and Motor Neuron Diseases, to dig into some recently published evidence on the effectiveness of a Daravone in the treatment of ALS. Dr. Berry, thanks so much for being with us this week on Connecting ALS. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it's a great topic and really looking forward to kind of unpacking some of this for listeners. Recently, in the last couple of weeks, new research was published on what we know about the IV dosage of a Daravone. So let's just jump right in. What do we know today that maybe we didn't know three or six months ago? Yeah, so the research that you're talking about is a, a retrospective analysis that comes from a large insurance claims database. So this is a database that encompasses millions and millions of people who have commercial insurance or Medicare Advantage insurance. So it doesn't include people who have Medicare and Medicaid insurance, um, which we can come back to later. Um, but from those millions of people, we get a lot of records about how they're how they move through the medical system. And one of those things is diagnoses like ALS. And another another piece of information we get is about prescriptions. And so using that data, we thought we could look back and and sort of see how people did when they when they received uh, IV Adarabone or when they didn't receive IV Adarabone with the diagnosis of ALS. And what did we learn? So the first thing I'll acknowledge is that it, this is a complex analysis to do, and it took many, many, many months well, with a collaborative team working on this to really try to ferret out what's relevant here and what could be uh, red herring or leading us down the wrong path. And what we found is that when we did all of those corrections, that people who were receiving IV Adarabone lived about six months longer in this data set than people who were not receiving IV Adarabone. And that's really, I think, one of the first times that we've seen a survival benefit to the drug and to see it in this real world environment was really, I think. Yeah, it is interesting. I, I want to take a little bit of a, maybe a sidetrack because, you know, I think about the process of science and we think about, you know, from idea to testing to clinical trials and approval. This is kind of post-approval. How common is this level of analysis to say, you know, we, we learned enough to get through the approval process, but we're going to want to go back and see what more can we learn through kind of real life experiences? I think it's becoming more and more common, although I'll acknowledge it's been going on for a long time. I mean, you know, if we look at Riliazole, for example, the approval of Riliazole was quite controversial at the time. Some people saying there wasn't enough evidence or the effect wasn't big enough or, or maybe it wasn't real. It was approved. And then over the years, we've seen many, many different papers that have looked at Riliazole's effect in different ways. And most of them have centered on some slowing effect on the disease. And I think it's the fact that we have those original randomized controlled trials as well as follow-up data that says that there is a benefit that has, you know, led to a broader acceptance, I think, of the original trial. So it's not uncommon. We're beginning to see a few of these analyses be done. And candidly, there are a couple of studies that have been done post-marketing for, for Adarifone that didn't show a survival benefit. And those were different study designs. And I think you know, it's the sum of all of the data that we have to look at to kind of see what we think is where the truth really lies. 
I would imagine that will become more commonplace and maybe more necessary as more treatments do come online. And now we're looking at different cocktails and how they interact with different patients who have different risk factors. Exactly. I mean, you know, looking at subgroup analyses or looking at, and actually more than subgroup analyses, what we may end up with is randomized trials that look at a very small slice of people with ALS that is, you know, a, a very restrictive inclusion criteria. And then real world studies that look at a much broader swath of people with ALS who are, you know, taking these drugs. And so they're, I think they're really valuable to supplement the data that we have from the randomized trials. Having said that, the data from the randomized trials is probably the highest quality data because it, you know, in science, what we'd like to do is test one question at a time, one variable at a time. And, and randomized trials are designed to do that. Real world evidence says, okay, the world is messy, but let's try to gather all the information we can um, despite that mess. And, and we have methods that allow us to really get rid of variables that we think are, are may sway our data one way or another, but not in a, not in a real way. You mentioned that the data set that was studied here was commercial insurance, private insurance, not traditional Medicare. Can we extrapolate from what we know and, and make maybe educated guesses or maybe inform future research so that we have a deeper understanding of it, the Medicare audience or whether this translates to a bigger slice of the population? That's a good question. I mean, it's easy to get out ahead of our skis here because, you know, it's, it'd be easy to say, well, gosh, I really think, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's in a Medicare database and, and somebody who's in a commercial database? And that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it as well, you know, maybe there are substantial differences. So I want to be careful in how I answer that. You know, that sometimes we just need the data to be able to, to kind of answer. The reason to go to a commercial database like this is that it's very comprehensive. So it has, you know, millions and millions of people and a lot of data about those people and it's not one commercial insurance, but broadly lots of insurances. And so if people switch carriers in the middle, we can still follow their progression throughout the disease. So it really provided the opportunity to look at this question in a lot of detail and follow people longitudinally. So it was, I think, the right tool for this question. Being able to go beyond that. You know, I think there are reasons to think that it would be reasonable to extrapolate this. But I also think that it's always best to you know, begin to think about how we might get that data too. The data set look at use of IV Adarivone, as, as listeners are well aware, an oral formulation was approved by the FDA for use in the treatment of ALS earlier this year. Are we able to do any type of educated guesses or extrapolation to think of what this might mean for the oral formulation? This is a great question. You know, the truth is that it goes all the way back to the randomized trials and how do we think about those as well. The data that came out about oral Adarivone is that the amount of Adarivone, the drug that gets into the bloodstream, is really equivalent between the oral dosing and the IV dosing. So there weren't additional studies that said, you know, let's compare placebo and oral Adarivone because we've already said, you know, with IV Adarivone, a certain amount of drug gets into the blood. And, you know, in those trials, that's, you know, we saw that there was a, that there was a benefit in slowing the disease on the ALSFRSR. The studies comparing oral to IV said, look, the same amount of drug gets to the bloodstream, whether you take it by this oral route or whether you take it by IV route. And so I think a reasonable assumption or, or hypothesis or theory from there would be to say, if you have the same amount of drug, whether it got there through uh, the oral formulation or the IV formulation, it should have this. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, I think, with, you know, recently with oral Adarivone, and now uh, we're seeing similar discussions happen with Relivrio, other potential treatments facing pedufidates. There's a lot of chatter in the community about access, like approval, it turns out it isn't the finish line. Access is the next conversation that happens. What have you seen in the marketplace that either inspires hope or frustration about some of those conversations around access? Yeah, I mean, I think we see hope and frustration together. You know, the frustration probably goes way beyond just the ALS community, I'll say. This is something that we see. And, you know, we read press stories about it in basically every disease that you can think of, you know, from diabetes and insulin to antibiotics and pediatric care. You know, access to drugs is a really big issue. And now when we talk about new drugs that are expensive and that are, you know, um, regulated by insurance and insurance carriers in a really heavy way, I think there are a lot of hoops to go through. When a new drug comes out, nobody's on that drug. And so there's a big push to get lots of people access to the drug all at once. 
And so we're trying to sort of really push a huge volume of referrals for, for that medication through a system that's really kind of built for a slow trickle, you know, which is where we get eventually, hopefully, so that, you know, the first you know, sort of everybody who has the disease is on the, on the right drug. And then we don't have as many people at a time trying to get access. The other thing that's happening when a drug first becomes available is that it's the first time that many times insurance companies are seeing that drug. And, and even in some cases, that indication at all, that disease. And so they don't have policies written about this and they need to go out and go to the community really and find out, well, how do we think about this drug's effect? You know, is this a drug that's supposed to stop or reverse the disease? Does that mean we stop covering it if it doesn't reverse the disease? Well, you know, for the drugs in ALS, that's not the case. But not everybody is an, is an ALS expert, so we have to lend that expertise to the insurance company. Yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. I want to stay on the subject of hope before I let you go back to the important work that you're doing. We're in that season of kind of looking back on the year that was and looking ahead to to the year that will be. You see anything on the horizon or, or anything in the current landscape of, of ALS research that inspires hope that real progress is on the horizon? You know, what a year to look back on. We had the approval of oral Adarifone. We had the approval of Relivrio, Albrioza in Canada, Relivrio in the U.S. And we had the um, submission and, and review of Tofersen for SOD1 ALS. I mean, to have all of that happen in a year is just remarkable. So we're, you know, we're very much looking forward to next year and potentially new approvals next year. But we also see a really robust ALS trials landscape where, you know, every part of ALS trials is being rethought. We have the, the Healy ALS platform trial that's sort of redefining how many drugs we can test at a time and how efficient we can be at testing that. And that allows us just to look faster and to get the answers faster because we're able to look faster and more efficiently and allow more people to have access to these experimental therapies along the way. We're rethinking expanded access programs and how they fit into our landscape and bringing more expanded access programs to people with ALS as well. And thinking about, you know, how do those expanded access programs exist as a part of drug development and how do they help us generate data? And then there are just more trials going on now than ever before. And those trials are based on more science, better models uh, than ever before. We're also seeing endpoints that are being iterated on. So the ALS FRSR can be done by self-entry. The ROADS is a new self-entry scale. And then we have scales that can have ball bar function and fatigue. And we're also, you know, finding new biomarkers like neurofilament light, which are sort of is coming, making its way into basically all trials. And digital biomarkers are also, I think, making an impact on, on the kind of data we can collect in trials. So every part of the machine is really moving forward. I think there's a lot of reason for hope. It echoes other things that I've heard from folks that I've been fortunate enough to talk to, but a hopeful note to, to close on. Dr. Barry, thanks so much for your time this week. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I want to thank my guest this week, Dr. James Barry. If you like this episode, share it with a friend. And while you're at it, please rate and review Connecting ALS wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a great way for us to connect with more listeners. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Racecar. Post-production by Alex Brower. Production management by Gabriella Montekin. Supervised by David Hoffman. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Thanks for tuning in. We'll connect with you again soon.